So let's talk about the poster boys of Warhammer 40k. How are the Ultramarines doing in 10th edition? Hello and welcome back to All Specs Tactics, where today we're delving into the Codex Astartes to talk through the Ultramarines forces and an overview of how the chapter is shaping up in-game in Warhammer 40k right now. We'll talk briefly about their lore, then go through each one of their unique special characters that they can field, their archetypical gladius formation, and one example army list that has the boys in blue doing well in-game. The Ultramarines in Warhammer 40k are about as well known as just about any faction in the setting, Space Marines are the most popular and widely played faction, and Ultramarines are pretty much the poster boys for the standard Codex Astartes supporting Space Marines on all the box art in the Games Workshop web store, and have been front and centre in 40k starter sets for the vast majority of their past editions. The Ultramarines theming is a sort of Roman-esque legion, where they're all about practicality, battle drill, and tactical flexibility. Rebute Gilliman is their primarch, the author of the Codex Astartes itself, pretty much a god of military strategy, employing the right tools and the right level of risk to ensure victory, and for his role with the Lord Commander of the Imperium, he very much needs to draw all his tactical acumen together to repel humanity's many threats, most recently the oncoming Tyranids of High Fleet Leviathan. The Ultramarines hail from their homeworld of Macrag, their chapter fortress monasteries in the Polar Fortresses, and Ultramar is perhaps an unusually civilised area of space governed by Marnius Kalgar, though they have seen multiple great wars waged against them in the Plague Wars and the devastation that was High Fleet Behemoth in the past. In game, these most exemplary space marines are represented by five unique character units now, Rebute Gilman, Marnius Kalgar, Chief Librarian Targurius, Captain Uriel Ventris, and Cato Sicarius. They did unfortunately have a few data sheets sent to Legends in the latest version of the Space Marine Codex, Sergeant Teleon, Cronus, and at least the Ultramarines data sheet for Chaplain Cassius have all gone that way, though that still leaves them with far more characters than most of the core Codex compliant chapters. Otherwise, for wider rules, I'd argue that they're loosely represented by the Gladius Task Force formation. Obviously any Space Marine chapters can use any one of the core Codex detachments, but this is the one that basically exemplifies the Ultramarine's way of war, different tactical doctrines and ultimate flexibility, and it does remain as one of the stronger ways to play Space Marines right now. First up I thought we'd start by going through the characters and then talk about the Gladius. First up I thought we'd start with Captain Uriel Ventris, leader of the Ultramarine's 4th Company. Resplendent in the green trim of that formation, as known to maybe see the Codex Astartes teachings as a bit more of a guideline than a rigid doctrine, perhaps making him kind of unusual for an ultramarine. Uriel Ventris is 75 points, and he can lead quite a selection of different squads, assault and regular intercessors, stone guard, blade guard, company heroes, or the tactical squad. He's got the stat line and defensive profile of a 5 wound Primaris Captain, 6 attacks at strength 6, AP 2, and damage 2 in combat, and he gets sustained hits 1 with his Sword of Idaeus. Maybe a little bit fightier than your average captain, though can't take a power fist or anything. Uriel gives up the free stratagem bonus that most space marine captains have, and the only rule that he has for leading his unit I think is a little bit weak, as it basically just still allows you to use stratagems on his unit even if the unit is battle shocked. Maybe not completely unhelpful in the right circumstances, but still not really that great I think. Otherwise though, his other special rule I think is genuinely very interesting, and with his role as Master of the Fleet, he allows one of your Adeptus Astartes infantry units to gain the Deep Strike special rule, so basically allows you to teleport in a unit that shouldn't usually have access to that rule, and that is kind of interesting. I'd say that Deep Strike rule is definitely the most interesting reason to take him, and perhaps the most fun thing is it doesn't have to be the unit that he's leading or anything, and that gives you a lot more flexibility than if he was tied to the squad, being a melee character that often might not really want to Deep Strike all that much. For detachment specific stuff, you could take some Fire Discipline Aggressors maybe, or perhaps Hellblasters, that could allow you a pretty good chance to get the big Wombo Combo damage output and put it in range of something really important in the enemy army and not have to buy something expensive in like a Land Raider to try and guarantee that. Could be interesting for other combos such as the Devastating Wounds Torrent Combo in the Firestorm Assault Force. That could be interesting to have some Aggressors with the Flamestorm Gauntlet stepping out of reserve there. Otherwise, I think that Deep Strike is kind of interesting both for Grav or Assault Centurions. Centurions are kind of slow, and getting their Grav Cannons within line of sight on a certain enemy unit, maybe particularly in something like the Vanguard Formation, where they can get extra AP and better Ballistic skill, that could be big. Or with the Assault Centurions, they can certainly do a fair bit of anti-infantry damage out of Deep Strike, but you could also Rapid Ingress those, and that could be one of the easiest ways to get that mighty vehicle busting melee into combat. 
Otherwise, eradicators feel like another fairly obvious choice. Short-ranged anti-tank weapons that would like a bit more flexibility than just turning up from strategic reserve. But basically anything else fire support related, like hellblasters or devastators, could be pretty nice as well. Overall, I'd say the only real main reason to take him is the deep strike special rule, and then he probably wants to just join a squad to make it a bit fightier. It's going to be helpful when killing some enemy elite infantry, but maybe won't have quite enough raw strength to take down enemy tanks or vehicles that often. Overall, I'd say it's interesting, probably mostly so if you actually need to deliver something really big and important, the fire discipline aggressors being a good target. Next up, we've got Chief Librarian Tigerius, also 75 points, and again, he's got a fairly flexible range of units that he can join, mostly similar ones to Uriel, but he can also join the Desolation Squad as well. As a Librarian, he only has 4 wounds, not 5, but he does get a 4 plus invulnerable save, so it's tankier than the standard Librarian, and that's not too bad seeing as he's genuinely really quite a cheap character at 75 points. Then, for his psyche attacks, he gets the Storm of the Emperor's Wrath. If he goes for the overcharged version, that's seriously punchy. 2d6, strength 6, AP2, and damage 2 attacks. Very nasty against enemy elite infantry there. And in combat, he's no slouch either. 5 attacks with the Rod of Tigurius is pretty punchy too. Besides this damage though, he does plenty more. He gets a 4 plus feel no pain against psychic attacks and mortal wounds. Never a bad thing to have. He gives his unit a minus 1 to hit, both at range and in melee, which does amp up their durability quite a bit, and then allows them to use one of a set list of stratagems for 0 CP, counter-offensive, overwatch, go to ground or heroic intervention. Perhaps the really reliably good one there is overwatch, means that if he's hanging out with a unit of stern guard or intercessors, then he should be able to get an extra burst of fire on enemies moving around in front of him, quite nasty when he can also fire his storm of fire in overwatch as well. Overall, for his raw character benefits, I really think he brings a lot to the table for 75 points. His own psychic damage is pretty good just in itself, killing around about 2 or 3 space marines, or around 5 termagants, not too bad for a single character, and never mind his melee. The minus 1 to hit is usually an extra 25 to 33% toughness to most squads, depending on what the enemy's ballistic skill is, and even better if it's mortal wounds or psychic damage. I think that overall, perhaps his biggest problem is what units he can join, He'd really, really like to be able to go with Hellblasters, but unfortunately he can't. And that perhaps means that he's best with something like Stern Guard, Devastators, or Intercessors, perhaps. It sort of feels like a weird case where you'd buy the squad specifically so you could include Tigerius in it, rather than the other way around. Otherwise, just in himself for 75 points, I feel like he brings just so much to the table. In a recent Librarian video, I ranked him 4.5 Library Rooks out of 5. Perhaps one of the best of the Librarians on offer for the Space Marines currently. Moving on, we've got the ruthless self-proclaimed legend that is Cato Sicarius, an 85 points captain who can lead company heroes, stern guard veterans, tactical squads, blade guard or assault intercessors. Damage and defense, he's fairly standard, 6 attacks at strength 5 AP 2, but he gets lethal hits on that Talisarian Tempest blade, making him a little bit more effective against really tough stuff I guess. A 2 plus armor save and an artisan plasma pistol that doesn't risk blowing himself up. Beyond that, he gets a trio of kind of interesting buffs, scouts of 6 inches, granting assault to his unit's guns, and a once per game reactive move, where if the enemy finishes a move within 9 inches of his model, his unit gets to reactive move 6 inches. It is a bit weird as all those rules are kind of powerful in their own way, getting units into the midfield is nice, getting assault on shooting is nice, and the reactive move is maybe a little bit situational, but in the right circumstances, say if you were facing an onrushing enemy charge and that kept you safe, or if the enemy triggered it and then you could hide behind some line of sight blocking cover to save them from shooting, both of those could be really quite good. It's perhaps just in a bit of a weird spot where any one unit maybe can't maximally use all of those at the same time. I guess Scout could be handy for getting Blade Guard closer to the enemy, but they don't care quite as much about the Assault keyword or the Reactive Move I'd say. I suppose the Assault keyword is kind of handy to have on things like Stern Guard or Intercessors, though their shooting output maybe isn't so exciting that you'd really be very tempted to build around him, and maybe not compare with all the myriad of other units that could buff their damage output or give them free stratagems or something. Overall, I just kind of feel like he's going to be a pretty rare choice for most people's armies, just a bit on the pricey side for a very non-focal collection of buffs. I think if Intercessors or Stern Guard would just enormously stand out strong as damage dealers in their own right, they'd be a bit more tempting, but at the moment that's just not really the case, they're not really the primary damage dealers that most people go for. Next up, moving on to the Chapter Master himself, we've got Marnius Kalgar. He's 195 points and comes with his own captainly profile, plus two Victrix Honor Guards in attendance. 
He's big and tough in Gravis armor with a 2 plus armor save and 6 wounds. The Victrix guards feel like they're a blade guard kind of profile. 3 wounds with a 4 plus invulnerable, but they also get a 2 plus save as well, which is rather nice. Between all that, he is bringing quite a lot more wounds and tankiness to the table than the majority of characters, though he does cost more of course. For damage, he gets the twin link shooting of the gauntlets of Ultramar. Not too bad for chipping away a little bit of extra damage while he's moving up in an aggressor squad or something. And then in melee, he is pretty mighty. Six attacks that are twin linked to strength 8, AP 3 and damage 3. That's a very nice generalist profile. The guards are certainly no slouch as well. Five attacks each hitting on twos at strength 5, AP 2 and damage 2. Quite a lot better than standard blade guard there. Marnius Kalgar I think gets the single most flexible squad selection out of the vast majority of Space Marine characters out there. He can lead most things that are either in Gravis armour or in Tacticus type armour. Though perhaps realistically the most standout choices are probably either the Aggressor Squad or the Blade Guard Veteran Squad. Both units that have quite a lot of raw muscle in their own right are perhaps worthy enough to accompany the Chapter Master into battle and cause some carnage. He can get a bit of a fairly serious Space Marine Death Star on the go with the three models from Marnius, six models of either Aggressors or the Blade Guard, and then maybe add in a Lieutenant or Apothecary Biologist as well. Otherwise, for his leadership buffs, he basically always has all the tactical doctrines in effect pretty much. His unit gets to advance and shoot, advance and charge, and fall back and shoot and charge as well. He's basically the culmination of a Gladius Task Force all by himself. Advancing, shooting and charging again is really handy for Aggressors or Blade Guard Veterans, means that you can move towards the foe and get longer charges off quite easily, and aggressors in particular really like the advance and shoot bit. Finally, his master tactician rule has a fair bit of value just in itself. Each battle round, you gain one command point just for Mr. Kalgar being on the board. Nice reliable extra CP that can be put into more stratagems there. Overall, I'd certainly say that Kalgar is one of the stronger characters of the Ultramarines. Pretty tough, pretty dangerous, helps to deliver blade guard or aggressors to combat, and gets you some CP in the bargain. Finally, we come to the Primarch and Lord Commander of the Imperium himself, Rebute Gilliman. 360 points in the post-codex world, must be the Warlord for what it's worth, and works with lone operative rules provided you've got some Adeptus Astartes infantry within 3 inches of his model, so he can't be shot from guns a long way away. Even if he can draw a bead on him, he's got some pretty tanky defensive stats, toughness 9, a 2 plus save, and a big 10 wounds. He's generally going to need some focused anti-tank firepower to bring him down, and then when he does get destroyed for the first time, he's got a 3 plus chance to just revive back onto the board with a full 6 wounds remaining. Really quite a massive threat that might dissuade your opponent from reliably killing him with one turn, and not expecting Gilliman to come back fighting. For his melee damage, he gets the Emperor's Sword and the Hand of Dominion, essentially a sweep and slash type profile but by another name. The Hand of Dominion is the anti-tank one with 7 attacks at strength 14 and AP 4, the Emperor's Sword is a big 14 attacks at strength 8, AP 3 and damage 2, and also devastating wounds. That little combo basically means that he's good against just about anything in the game, killing around about 10 horde models or a similar number of space marines, around about 3 terminators, and then against heavy hitters you could expect around about 12 wounds to a vehicle with a 5 plus invulnerable save. Basically if he catches most normal sized units in the game, they're probably going to be dead. Otherwise, for his buffing rules, he gets the option between a choice of double oath of moment, marking two different targets for the big hit rerolls in one turn. Definitely can be handy enough just to bring a little bit more damage where it's most needed, or he has the option to trade that out for his Supreme Strategist special rule, allowing you to target an extra unit within 12 inches for a battle tactic stratagem for 0 CP, potentially meaning that you could have the same stratagem go off three times in a phase in one army if you really wanted it, between him, a captain, and a regular use of a strat. Previously, when double oath of moment meant four wound rerolls against two different units as well, I would have said that that was the superior choice. But now it's only reroll hit rolls, I think it's a lot more balanced, and often you might be better off with the free stratagems, particularly depending on which detachment that you're playing in. I feel like, weirdly enough, Gilliman is a particularly nice choice for the Iron Storm Spearhead. You could maybe have the battle tactic stratagem that gets you sustained hits on multiple vehicles at the same time. That would be some pretty monstrous extra damage out there, and he could be handing out extra armour of contempt in the enemy turn. Finally, that lone operative protection special rule could certainly be gamed a bit. You could use it to trigger with the lone operative lieutenant with combi weapon, so they both trigger the lone operative rule, or just potentially standing next to an infantry unit that's hiding out of line of sight, so the lone operative will be maintained that way. 
Overall, I feel like Gilliman was pretty standout good at the very start of 10th edition, though I feel like at this point's cost, and now both the Oath of Moment has been limited, and Master of Battle is limited to battle tactic stratagems, he maybe just feels a bit more take or leave at this point's cost, I wouldn't say auto-include, but definitely pretty terrifying, and provides some enormous buffs if you did want to choose to include him in a list. Finally for the Ultramarines, we come to the Gladius Task Force, pretty much the archetypical detachment of the chapter, and this one exemplifies the Ultramarine's flexible fighting strategy in three different turns of movement then damage boosts in Devastator Doctrine, Tactical Doctrine and Assault Doctrine. These are declared in the command phase, so you can basically choose the one that's going to be most impactful for your army, and if any one unit needs to access one of the other ones, then you can do so for one command point as a stratagem. All of the doctrines are potentially very powerful. Advance and shoot can be quite nice early game to get lines of sight with heavy weapons. It can be particularly good if you just need both the advance movement and also don't want to give up the unit's firepower as well to get onto an objective. That can be big. Access to it helps out shorter ranged units, things like aggressors or eradicators potentially. Advance and Charge allows you a much bigger threat range, an average increase of 3.5 compared with your normal move and charge threat that you would have had before. Really quite a big deal to flex into if there's a crucial charge that absolutely needs to happen and you need some more guarantees. And fallback Shoot and Charge can be pretty handy for quite a lot of things out there, things that you just really don't want to afford to stay in melee with a scary enemy damage dealer, but you still don't want to lose the damage output of the unit completely. Maybe a bit more situational and a bit less in your control but it definitely does come up. For the stratagems, you get Armour of Contempt, the standard damage debuff, always nice with anything with particularly high saves. Honor the Chapter gives you Lance Melee, so a plus one to wound in combat, and extra AP if you're in the Assault Doctrine as well, really quite a big melee boost on the turn that they charge if they're in Assault. That can be quite a nice one to use with certain Captain Free stratagems, as it means that their unit can be hitting exceptionally hard when they hit home. For one command point, squad tactics is an infantry or mounted unit option to move d6 inches at the end of the enemy movement phase. If an enemy unit finished a move within 9 inches of your unit, this means they can sneak away d6 inches or boost it all the way up to 6 inches in tactical doctrine. And this one's nice to be able to hide out of line of sight of enemies, backpedal from oncoming charges and potentially keep a unit safe that would have died or maybe sneak a bit of movement towards objectives and perhaps flip a point over in the exact right circumstances. Very disruptive for the opponent to move all their units around and then have some of your units reposition to maximally frustrate them. Next up, Storm of Fire is the Ignore's Cover one when you're shooting, and you get some extra AP if you're in Devastator Doctrine as well. Essentially, if both the cover and the AP are relevant, then you get AP-2 on what you would have had otherwise. Really quite big for low AP shooting, things like Grav Cannons maybe, and it's a big part of the big fire discipline combo for aggressors. Only in death is two command points for your units to fight in death, and you have to use it when the opponent declares attacks rather than when things die. For two command points, I think it's okay. It does guarantee melee damage, but at a big cost. And then finally, for one command point, there's adaptive strategy, the option to flex into any one of those doctrines. Situationally, they can all be absolutely awesome on the right unit at the right time, and for one command point, that can often be well worth it. Overall, some solid stratagems. Most of them see some good use. I feel like perhaps the worst value out of them might be the only in death, which is just a bit pricey at the 2 CP. At the right time or situationally, the rest can all be absolutely standout. For enhancements, we've got the Honor Vehement, 15 points for a plus 1 strength and plus 1 attack, or plus 2 of both if you're in the Assault Doctrine. I feel like this one's usually not one you'd go out to buy, but to fill the last few points, it's handy enough on a captain, I guess. The Artificer Armor is 10 points for a 2 plus save and a 5 plus feel no pain. Again, a pretty big toughness boost, reasonable enough, and particularly on something like a Gravis Captain, you could make one of those seriously chunky with this. Add up to the Codex is 20 points, and this one's a Captain only one. That's a once per game extra tactical doctrine for the Bearers unit only. Kind of a bit rubbish really when you can flex to it for one command point anyway. But really the star of the show is most certainly Fire Discipline. A big 30 points, but it gives you a nice flat sustained hit one for the Bearers lead unit at range. Always good for a bit of extra firepower, quite nice on things like Eradicators, Aggressors or Hellblasters. But the really big thing that you can do with it is that in the Devastator Doctrine it gets you a 5 plus critical hit. And that pairs absolutely excellently with a Lieutenant or an Apothecary Biologist, giving you both sustained and lethal hits against your target. And both of them going off on a 5 plus just for some enormous mass damage. 
That combo I'd argue is perhaps the single biggest out of the entire detachment and in general the big choices for it tend to be either aggressors or maybe hellblasters, aggressors being more common with Boltstorm gauntlets using them to just get a silly amount of damage on basically anything in the game. For absolutely maximal damage combine it with Oath of Moment and reroll anything that isn't a 5 plus to get those sustained and lethal hits in spades. You can use Storm of Fire for 1 command point for ignores cover and extra AP if desired and you can make the units in Devastator Doctrine for one command point as well. Then he just needs to deliver the units to the front line and get shooting away. Typically, perhaps the best use of this might be the Aggressor Squad. This is for an Aggressor Squad with an Apothecary Biologist, and then spending either one or two command points on the Stratagems to get them going. That gets you 40 shots at Strength 4, AP-2, Damage 1, and ignores cover if they're targeting their closest units. A ridiculous amount of rerolls, sustained and lethal hits, and on average the closest unit within 18 inches just takes this amount of damage. On average 44 Termagans, 10 Intercessors, 6 Terminators, 20 wounds to a 3 plus save vehicle, or a big 15 wounds to even something like a 2 plus save land raider, or something with a 4 plus invulnerable. The numbers here are pretty crazy with just bolters. You can then of course absolutely go on to charge if you want to as well, and the aggressors with their power fists absolutely would enjoy that. Overall, if you're playing Gladius, I'd certainly want a combo that looks something like this on the board. The Hellblaster one works kind of fine as well, has the advantage of a bit of extra AP and a fair bit of extra range, though it does cost a bit more and doesn't have the melee as a second punch. Overall, I feel like the Ultramarines really aren't in a bad spot in 10th edition at all. They've got four characters that I could see being pretty good value in the right list, maybe Cato Zacharias letting the side down a little bit there, and the Gladius Task Force remains as one of the strongest formations for the Space Marines in 40k 10th edition. It still seems to be winning tournaments with some good regularity. Not too bad a time to play the boys in blue overall, and in their iconic formation. Finally, here's just one Ultramarines Gladius Task Force list that I featured a good few weeks ago on the channel, and this one was a tournament winning list by a Jared Gomez, who used it to take first at the Dragon's Lair Open GT, with 58 players and going 6-0. It's a pretty good Ultramarines list featuring Kalgar and also the Gladius Detachment. Leading the list is Kalgar himself, and he's backed up by none other than four different Primaris Lieutenants, one with a Power Fist and Fire Discipline, and going with a big squad of 10 Hellblasters. One with the Power Weapon and Storm Shield loadout, looking like they'll be accompanying Kalgar with the Blade Guard most likely. A Phobos one that looks like he'd be going with some Infiltrators for a bit of move, shoot, move. And a Combi Weapon one to be an annoying lone operative, and it's just generally helpful with marking a midfield objective. Beyond that, there's some strong objective support, with Inceptors dropping in with Plasma, some Incursors to mark targets, two units of Infiltrators to deny Deep Strike, and a unit of cheap and expendable Scouts. Then for some heavy lifting, there's two Gladiator Lancers for some enormous anti-tank, a Brutalist Dreadnought which makes some good use of the Gladius Task Force advanced and damaged sort of options, and a Whirlwind for a little bit of indirect fire. Overall, very clearly successful, and a list to make the Codex Astartes proud. A nice balance of range and melee, and some interesting infiltration and disruption and scoring options. In any case, let me know how your boys in blue have been faring on the 40k battlefields of 10th edition so far, Look forward to hearing all your thoughts down in the comments and which Ultramarines characters have been making it into your list. If you've enjoyed the video then feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics where I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I do tend to post new ones just about every day and I'm sure we'll have plenty more for the Space Marines. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support and keep these coming. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.